I think Dale is the only one that we're missing. Yeah, we'll look for it. We've got some extras. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Wineblood. I'm on the regional advisory committee. I'd like to welcome everybody here. Call the meeting to order. I would like to members of the advisory committee or who are here in person, if they would go around and introduce themselves. And then uh, we'll read off the list instead of trying to go through on the computer and get everybody to introduce. Okay. My name is Keith Bruno from Dorn Seafood in Oregon. I fish, I have a fish house. And online, we have Everett Blake, who is vice chair. Uh, I assume Missy's on. Missy Clark is on. She's not on. Carl Hacker. Yes. Jamie Lane. Bill Martin. Thomas Newman and Roger. Thank you all for doing it in. Um, before we kind of get started with the details, we are fortunate enough tonight to have Director Kathy Roth here and Colonel Whitman. So we're glad to have both of them here tonight. We'll move into the vote for the approval of the agenda. <clears throat> I would entertain a motion unless there are any additions to the agenda to approve as submitted. Make a motion. I have a motion. Worthington is in second. I second. Greeno is second. Any discussion? All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. It sounded like the majority. Agenda is approved as submitted. We'll now entertain uh, see copies of the January 10th meeting minutes. Um, unless there are any corrections or additions to the minutes, entertain a motion to approve minutes. Make a motion to approve this. I have, I have a motion by Mr. Worthington. Second. Second. If there's no discussion and no objection, uh, we will move towards approval of the meeting minutes by the consent. Is there any objection to approving the minutes by consent? I see no hand, no objection, so minutes stand approved by consent. We'll move into the Marine Fisheries Commission update, Alara. Thank you, Chair. Um, so good evening, everybody. Uh, I am going to be giving you an update from the February business meeting that was held in New Bern. And um, I am going to just touch on the highlights from that meeting. Uh, but I also want to remind everyone that those meetings are recorded. Um, we have a lovely video. <laughs> and um, they are available online for um, anyone who's interested to go back to listen to the full meeting um, or any Part of that meeting. So um, we have our um, PIO staff who actually go through and mark those meetings. So if there's any specific piece of the meetings that you want to listen to, you, it's really easy to go back in and listen to specific issues. Um, so if there are more details, if you want to hear the discussion, please do feel free to go back and listen to those. Um, otherwise, I might be the only one who goes back and listens to those over and over again. <laughs> 
Um, it will impact your YouTube algorithm, just to warn you. Um, and so uh, once I have gone over these highlights, uh, I will open it up to any additional questions that you have. Um, so with that, um, I want to start with false albacore. So in February, the commission reviewed a false albacore information paper that the division had prepared um, at their request. So this was an update to a 2017 paper that was um, a, just a general review of information um, on the false albacore fishery in North Carolina. And following quite a bit of discussion on that issue, um, the, uh, the commission actually ultimately did pass a motion um, asking staff to develop rulemaking language with uh, management options for false albacore, um, starting with the status quo and allowing for growth in the fishery at various percentage points. So staff are reviewing available data to define some of those terms. Um, so for example, what is the status quo currently? Um, and um, the division are gonna be presenting its initial analysis at the commission's May meeting. Um, and the final issue paper um, with the rule language is expected uh, to come either at the August or November commission meeting for their review and then possible selection of um, their preferred management option. Um, next up is spotted sea trout. So um, I'm not going to go too far into this because we are going to have uh, more time to discuss it later on the agenda. But um, in February, the staff leads did present to the commission an overview of the spotted sea trout fishery in North Carolina. And they received input from commissioners on items for consideration in the FMP development. So just as a reminder, um, we are uh, we just completed the scoping period um, for items uh, to for the. Oops, I just went backwards. I apologize. We just completed the scoping period for spotted sea trout, and so we're at the very beginning of the FMP development. So. Um, in the past, we heard a lot of concern from people, the public, and from commissioners and from advisors that they felt like they didn't have a chance to um, give their comments about fishery management plans before the plans had already been drafted and they felt like it was too late. So the scoping periods are held before anything is drafted. So there is no plan currently, there's no new plan drafted for spotted sea trout. So the scoping periods were held. Um, the public input is being um, combined and gathered um, to be presented to the commission. Um, and then we're also gonna be um, bringing them the goal and objectives in May to discuss. And then staff are gonna then take that all that information and anything that we get from the advisory committees as well. Uh, and they're gonna start to work on that management plan. Um, and so, uh, like I said, uh, this is just the beginning. Um, I do want to mention the um, the uh, feedback that we got from Commissioner Cross. Um, I think a lot of people have heard about, um, he gave what was more comprehensive input than maybe most people have at this point. Um, but it did uh, result in a lot of interesting conversation. So because it's at the beginning of the process, um, that's good because the public has, you know, given us a lot of feedback on that. <laughs> so that's really helpful because, like I said, the plan, we're going to step into developing that plan now, and we've had a lot of that feedback already. So, so <laughs> there's the sunny side of the street. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, so now to stripe mullet. Um, so just as a reminder, back in November um, at the last year, the commission actually had selected their preferred management option for striped mullet supplement A. Um, and you guys talked about that at your October meeting. And um, that was, they selected a, a statewide season closure from November 7th through December 31st, which was estimated to result in a 22.1% reduction. So, when they selected that option, that then went out for public comment. You um, had the chance to review that also at your January meetings as part of that public comment period. Um, and the um, 
at their February meeting, there was a lot of discussion and basically the outcome of that meeting and that discussion and the feedback that they received was that they really wanted to look at uh, regional, regionally specific management. Uh, so they requested, uh, they, they asked the division uh, to provide regionally specific management for striped mullet. So that discussion is going to continue at the May meeting on striped mullet supplement A. Again, as a reminder, supplement A is meant to be short-term management. We expect that that management would be for 2023 because Amendment 2 is currently um, under development, and we do uh, anticipate that that will be in place by the 2024 season. So, um, again, we're just talking about Supplement A for the 2023 season. <clears throat> Let's see. What's next? Um, I'm going to wrap it up with a chip item. So the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan, um, the commission passed a motion in support of a resolution from the stakeholder engagement for collaborative um, coastal habitat and initiative. And this is part of the implementation from uh, the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan that was passed in 2022. Um, and so this is actually, uh, it was sort of an add-on to the CHIP plan at the end. All three commissions um, like the idea of having sort of a, um, a cooperative stakeholder group to help implement these, um, to help implement and support habitat protection actions. So that came out of that group and um, that has now uh, moved forward. And... Um, other than that, uh, the May meeting is scheduled for May 24th through the 26th, and it is set um, to be held at the Beaufort Hotel. Um, we have started to have a pretty standard rotation um, of hotels and locations. So May is our Beaufort Hotel location. <laughs> um, and other than that, I can answer any questions if anybody else has is there anything they'd like to talk about? Questions on the MFC recap? And I do have um, a follow-up to some discussion items that we had last time. So that's that sort of wraps up the meeting-specific stuff. Mm -hmm. you know. um, Rel relative to false applicable. Yes. Is that addressed in any of the South Atlantic plans? That is addressing North Carolina only management. So it, we are, and jump in, Lee, if you have okay. more comment. Okay, so this would be for just for uh, North Carolina. Yeah, so, I know, but I, I was thinking in some of the It's been discussed, I think, at um, ASMC. Yes. And I think it's supposed to come back up again. So the South Atlantic, it's even come up in the but, but they have not yeah. taken it up as a management. Mm -mm. They've only discussed it. Okay. Uh, then they're going to discuss Benita as well. When they just did, and and Fox Abacore came up during those discussions. Thomas has a question. Maybe yes, I don't. Know. Yeah, go ahead, Thomas. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize. You can see it. I can't. Yeah. The, uh, the so the South Atlantic chose not to manage the uh, Little Tooney, Fox Albacore. They decided to look at it every three years. Uh, the AP is supposed to look at it every three years. I'm on the that micro copy AP. And the uh, Atlantic states will be looking at something their staff's putting together at their next meeting. Uh, I think that's the first week of May. But uh, I also had a question, too, if anybody's got more answer to that. Go ahead. Uh, if if our state chooses to manage uh, false albacore, do do we have do we have to get like a um, an advisory group together to, to develop the FMP, or can the uh, or can the commission develop their own FMP? So right now, what they're talking about doing is basically creating uh, guardrails on a fishery using current. Uh, authority. So it wouldn't really be to develop a fishery management plan. 
it would just be to um, set some guardrails around the growth of that fishery. Okay, so. so that, yes, it would require rulemaking. Okay, so they can't, the, the F, F, uh, MFC can't arbitrarily set a cap on a quota without approval from someone else. Is that correct? Because that kind of worried me when they developed a, uh, when they suggested a commercial cap. And I just didn't want to, I, I didn't know if the MFC had that power to put a cap on the fisheries, a quota cap. No, I think it would, it would have to go through rulemaking. And Thomas, this might be a question that we should really address more thoroughly um, offline with the species leads who are working on it, just to okay. get the specifics. Because um, yeah, I, well, I, I, I sent a division. To, I, yeah, oh, I sent I'm a sorry. division email about a month ago about that, and I never received. Oh, you did? Yes, uh, I didn't include you in the email. I'll include you next time. Yes, include me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Thomas, this is Kat. Can you hear me? Yeah, I just wanted to add that. So, to Laura's point, the commission asked the commission to put together some guardrails and, and bring it back to the day, which is what we plan to do. Now, if ASMSC were to take up management of falls out in their management plan, then we could ask, our commission could ask them to be on a manage through our interjurisdiction plan. Uh, up past year, we would have to, our commission would have to make, which I think it's what they're potentially considering. And we'll see where it goes, but at this point, that's what they're looking at, just we'll make it so that they can put the blood out of the picture. Yeah, I appreciate that, Director Rawls. I got most of that. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the info. I'll see what happens at the next uh, MFC meeting and keep in contact with you guys. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Uh, relative to the CHIP and uh, all three commissions working together to help implement. So the respective commissions and their rulemaking jurisdictions to implement any of those measures will have to go through the full process if it's a CR standard, Coastal Resources Commission is going to have to have public comment, review the whole nine yards, and it won't be up to the three, the foreman of the three commissions, they will not be the ones that enact it. Um, you mean in terms of like if it was the steering committee, um, the way that they work together? Or you mean, yes, it would be each commission will adopt the rules as they were approved their through the plan. Jurisdictions and yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So I think that was a dog. <laughs> um, so um, I did want to update everyone on the um, outcome of the July um, advisory workshop. So we had a request from a number of people to have all of the advisory committees meet together. And um, we reviewed uh, bylaws and public meeting rules and travel policies. And what we have come up with is uh, an advisory committee workshop that we are um, planning for July, where all five committees will be uh, meeting. And the winner, the day winner was July 10th. So that was the Monday of the week that we put. We tried to pick basically as many days as we could to give as many options. Um, so there were over, I think it was over 50% of the respondents Day, July 10th was the day that fit most people's schedule. So um, that is the day. It, uh, right now, we're early stages of planning the actual activity, but um, what we're thinking is it will involve opportunity for you guys to sit at tables with your fellow advisors from all the different um, committees and talk about 
your experiences, uh, things that you like, things you don't like, things that you think could be better, um, and also uh, to hear from staff. Uh, we had a lot of requests, um, you know, over the last couple of meetings, uh, requests for sort of more uh, broader explanations of sort of FMP processes, uh, how, where are we with all these different FMPs, things like that. And so um, we're looking at doing presentations of that nature. So sort of bigger uh administrative presentation so that we can explain some of that stuff to you guys. Um, and then also um, just an opportunity to talk to each other. So it's going to be held at the North Carolina Aquarium at Pine Mill Shores. We did try to find um, a location that was more central and we were unsuccessful. Um, we have been able to get <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, dog, for barking. <laughs> um, we were able to get the aquarium uh, because our mission aligns with their mission. Um, we are going to be able to use that facility for free, uh, which is very helpful. So we are hoping to provide um, support for travel, for people to travel in and get hotel rooms since we know people are going to have to be traveling long distance. So um, Paula and I are working... Um, on that, we are um, reaching out to the aquarium staff and also um, other staff from around the state to um, get that planned. And also we'll be reaching out to all of you with more of the details as we get that more solidified. Um, but if anybody has any comments about things you'd like to hear about at that meeting, or if you have any comments at all about that workshop, um, that's, that was a good opportunity. Is it 10 to 3? Tentatively 10 to 3. It, it's not set in stone at the moment, but yes. Any comments or questions relative to the workshop? Please. All right. Well, that wraps me up. The um, sea tracks open discussion, no presentation. Correct. Leads are here. We do have the leads here. <laughs> if they'll come up Blue and join us. But I can give this kind of brief review. Your phone is just out of the Morehead City office. Um, I do appreciate the chance to come here and chat with you all about scoping. Uh, so we had over 700 people participate in the spot of sea trial scoping process by either coming to a meeting or uh, filling out our online questionnaire. So that was a high level engagement. I would love it. Um, so again, if y'all are interested, I can quickly review what we heard, uh, just kind of high level stuff, and then be happy to answer any questions or I think, it, I think it would be beneficial to kind of hit the high spots of what you heard. Perfect. That I can definitely do. So I broke these out uh, in the, uh, just in the potential management strategies that we looked at or are looking at. So for sustainable harvest, uh, comments centered around uh, not having a quota, seasonal closures, bag promotions, Trip limit reductions and increasing the minimum size. Limit. And for all of these, we heard, uh, you know, I do think it's important to do that we heard folks speak for these things, against these things, and probably everything. This is again just kind of that high level of what we heard. Uh, for recreational management, uh, we've broken that into things that were specific to spotted sea trout and things that weren't. Specific to spotted sea trout, we heard a lot of main fish, 
a lot of outreach about catch and release best practices. Um, no uh, recreational, commercial, beer, or harvest of spotted sea trout, both limits, uh, eliminating the catch and limited entry. In general, we heard uh, about reducing the impact that tournaments have, especially catch and release tournaments, and uh, the implementation of gear requirements. Uh, as far as commercial management is concerned, spotted sea trout specific, comments centering around the uh, hook and line spotted sea trout fishery uh, and limiting entry into spotted sea trout fishery. And then in general, uh, for general commercial management, we heard comments about reducing overall guild net efforts, reducing overall commercial efforts in general, closing the personal consumption loophole, commercial subsidies aims towards uh, phasing out guild nets, some area limitations, increasing the guild net Gill net, minimum mesh size. Uh, say that one five times fast. And then requiring uh, guild net dependence uh, year round in, in regardless. As far as protecting small beast on five, centering around slot limits, bag limits, increasing the minimum size, uh, and around our cold stun closure protocol. Uh, as far as area management is concerned, this was actually one a potential management strategy that we added based on the comments that we heard. Um, so we heard comments about closing specific areas to gill nets. We heard comments about closing specific areas to all spotted sea trout fishing. And then we heard a call for more regionalized or uh, localized management. Um, as far as uh, comments around uh, Commissioner Cross's proposal that uh, Laura mentioned earlier, uh, overwhelmingly comments were against his proposal, and uh, most folks felt that it was uh, those measures were unnecessary in the spotted sea trout fishery, uh, and most of those were geared uh, or were centered around not wanting a quota in the spotted sea trout fishery and not wanting uh, to end catch and release fishing. <clears throat> And then general ideas that don't really fit into any of the ones that I've mentioned previously, uh, we're looking at, uh, we, we heard comments for calling for uh, more ecosystem or multi-species management, uh, for stocking spotted sea trout, uh, for increased enforcement efforts uh, to look at the management in other states and model our management off of that, and then for a recreational reporting app. That's what we heard. <laughs> it was a lot. It was a lot. It was great, though. But yeah, a lot of people came out. A lot of people gave comments. Uh, and yeah. I'd be happy to, you know, if you all have any questions about any of that or uh, just questions in general. No, I'm here. He pretty much covered what we heard. So, yeah, and if you guys have questions about the input we received or any additional input you'd like to give as far as you know management we should consider for the sea trout fishery? We definitely want to hear it. A question from committee member relative to um, what we heard that the division heard at the scope committee. He's saying that any committee member wants to add kind of as an issue relative to what. Okay. I didn't hear mine regurgitated. I'm still happy <laughs> about taking crawfish funds and through one of our universities, whether it be State, ECU, Duke, Carolina. Uh, anyone that have a marine program to go in there and let's conduct some research with that so we can have some good data and not just a wild ass guess. Start these management plans. I've seen I've seen some of the stuff that Ruffle funds have been spent on, and this is where it needs to be. This is what we did with Cobia, and I think this is what we need to do. We need to have some true hard numbers, and not numbers from back. In, what was it, two thousand eight? Uh, are, are you talking the discard uh, the recreation about? Yeah, study on on on, on more rugged mortality. Yeah, so that one, uh, the delayed mortality uh, from recreational fishing, it was it was 2002. 
is when that study happens. Um, but as far as the- I had hair in 2002. <laughs> Lots changed. That's fair. Well, I would say that that study, I mean, the, the discard mortality rates that were seen in that study are fairly comparable with ones that other states have done, uh, either older studies or more recent studies. Uh, so even though the study was from 2002, the mortality rate, you know, seems to be pretty in line with what other states are seeing. Uh, we did use that 10% value for our stock assessment for the recreational discard mortality. Florida, I believe, uses 9%. I think Texas uses 10% as well. They're the other states that do sea trout stock assessments. Uh, so the number we're using is not uh, a crazy number. There is science behind it. There was a study that was done, conducted in the way that those studies are typically done to get that discard mortality rate. Uh, we could redo it. Um, you know, certainly, you know. Well, I think it's straight up your argument at, at, at meetings rather than coming up with the 10%. I try the 10% with my CPA. I said, I'm not paying 10% of what you're saying. I'm going to decrease it. He didn't buy it. So that's what the problem is at these meetings. You regurgitate this and not having any true peer reviewed science behind it, but you're putting on that board up there. And that's causing the temperature boom to go up. I mean, a lot of those studies are peer reviewed. Uh, you know, I don't think the one the division did specifically was sent to a peer review journal, but other ones that are in line with the study we did certainly have been. That methodology has been peer reviewed. Uh, so I don't have any question about the methodology or the science that was done to get that estimate. Uh, we could redo it. We could certainly submit it to a journal and get it peer reviewed and published. I just think uh, it helps your argument in the meetings when you're trying to put a enforcement or close the season or want to grill limit if you got some in the back of up with it. But I would say though that you know we did use that information and that data in our stock assessment. Our stock assessment does undergo an external peer review by experts in stock assessments and spotted sea trout specifically. And you know they did not have any issues with the, the estimates we were using. Uh, in their opinion, you know, through that peer review, everything, the science was sound. There's a table also in the in the stock assessment um, that documents different hook and line mortality studies, some done by universities, um, some done by state agencies. If you want to check it out, there's probably 10 or 12 studies in there, um, not just one that we, we used, um, from our specific um, research. But the reason we used our research was because our study was in line um, with the other studies in the other stock assessment. Uh, like you said, Louisiana, Texas, and um, Florida, I'll, I'll use right around 10% mortality in their stock assessments as well. I get that, but I'm looking from the village perspective when, the, when they show up at the meetings and they hear 2,000. Yeah, I agree. What the hell have you been and, That's, that's and hook and line, their attitude. Hook and line mortality is, is um, in our research priorities and things. It's something we've been looking at updating. And to your point, I mean, we're always looking to pair up or even to provide money to universities to do that type of research. It just takes somebody who's willing to take it on, come up with a good proposal that, that can be funded and embedded. Um, I know, I'm trying to think, is it like NC State's done some work on red drum release mortality, which is funded through the state. Um, I'm trying to think specifically throughout, I can't think of anything, but I think it's something we would definitely support. And obviously, corrupt money would be perfect for it. So typically, um, hook and release mortality studies are done um, in a controlled way. Um, the fish are hook and line, just like anybody with hook and line. Sometimes they may use fishing guides, they work with recreational fishing, or they may just catch the fish themselves. If you're going to look at the hook tight, the handling time, they're going to try to control all the variables. Then they're going to hold the fish like in pins. Um, for a number of days, and they're going to monitor how many fish die, like after 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, and then usually it's about three days is the standard. Um, and then they're going to they're going to release the fish at the end of that, and it's, it's going to be the number that died at the end of that are going to be considered your release mortality. And then sometimes they may get estimates through things like tags, like even telemetry tags, where they put a monitor on the fish and they can track it moving around. Um, they so there's different ways to do it, but typically the pen study is the way to do it. 
I've read a lot of studies, Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, Louisiana, Texas, percent's a low number compared to the rest of them. The rest of them, like Louisiana, they're talking about 20% or more. Florida's talking about 15 to 18. I mean, it goes on. I mean, I've read, I hadn't read one yet that said 10%. Yeah, I mean, there seems to be, you know, there is a range out there in literature for, for sea trout. Yeah. Uh, there's some that are lower. There's some that are higher Yeah. Uh, than that 10% right. number. But, but like Lee said, we used that 10% number. Yeah. We saw. I mean, you can read, you can read, you can read, you can read uh, so many of them, and, and they'll range from 15% to 40% or 30%. You know, there's a, a wide range in there. I think Mr. Newman had a question. Thomas, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I'll agree with what staff said. Uh, I went to a few of these studies too. 10% is on the low end of what most other states have. And uh, I also want to thank the staff. It was it was a lot of staff at all of these scoping meetings. And uh, the one I personally attended, almost every staff member was taking notes, not just one staff member. All of the staff members were taking notes of what people were saying. And staff has really been engaged with this and doing the best they can with the with the data that's come out of this come out of this last stock assessment. Uh, and ten percent is gracious. <laughs> it, it could be a lot. It could be a lot worse for the recreational uh, discard mortality. But uh, my question was on on discard mortality as well. Uh, what was the what was the average weight given to the dead discards? In order to calculate that, uh, to like to turn the uh, dead discards from a number of fish into pounds. Yes, that's correct. It was, uh, it was like 0 0.9 uh, pounds per fish. And we use that number. That number comes from the uh, uh, the midpoint of the, and I'm sorry, this is going to sound, it's going to get technical for a second here. Uh, the midpoint of the, of the, uh, just the recreational discard uh, fleet from the stock assessment. So basically that was just estimated with our, uh, our tagging data. And it gives us an idea of the size of fish that's generally released. Uh, and it comes out to about a, I think it was like 13 and a half inches or maybe just a tiny bit uh, touch over that. Um, and then a 13 and a half inch fish on average weighs just under a pound. So that's where that 0 0.9, um, you know, and there's a lot more digits that go after it. Uh, but that's how we go from a, from a fish to pounds of fish for the discards. What happens uh, next in the, I'm sorry, Thomas. Oh uh, yeah. I, yeah. I hate, I uh, can't be in there in person. I wish I was in there in person right now. Trust me. Uh, yeah. I also was wondering uh, as well, I thought the stock assessment it maybe mentioned that there wasn't there wasn't a way to uh, figure out our reductions in uh, discards by looking at different uh, gear type uses for recreational fishing, just as like say a barbless hook or uh, no treble hooks or something like that. Is that true? Would y'all be able to estimate that type of reduction if you were to 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 initiate some uh, hook rule, or is that not possible because we don't have the baseline data to do that it would be difficult because we you you would need to know uh what angler behavior is currently uh so you need to know basically how many folks are fishing with uh treble books or you know whatever the gear is that we're looking to change you know whether it's j hooks with live bait whether it's treble books on a hard bait whatever that is we can certainly calculate um, the decrease in, in discard mortality going from, uh, let's say, a, a J hook with a live bait to a circle hook with a live bait. But if we don't know uh, the number of folks that are, are already fishing with a circle hook versus the number of folks that are fishing uh, with J hooks in that manner, it's really hard to calculate what, uh, what that has been reduction. So it becomes one of those things that's like a, a you know, uh, we would need to, to be able to gather that data on the front end to really be able to say, okay, now we put that rule into place. 
people are all fishing with, uh, you know, clients 100%, everybody fishes with a circle. But now, now we can calculate that reduction. But without that first input of how many people uh, are changing their behavior because of that rule, it, it would be hard to actually calculate that reduction. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So, so basically, it's probably not going to be be able to put into this impl implement into this uh, plan this upcoming FMP. And I would say probably not this one, no, just because we would have to. Okay. Well, well, I mean, it depends I, whether it's put in as a some, as a quantifiable measure or something that you know we can actually put a number to or not. We could certainly, uh, you know, put in the plan. You know, explore, you know, making certain hook types required or at least encouraging their use. Uh, you know, that, that's definitely something we could do in the plan and explore in the plan. But like Lucas said, that's not something we would necessarily be able to quantify a reduction from uh, at, at this point with the information we have. And I'm that's sorry, I was, I was meaning a quantifiable reduction in this plan. Right. Said, probably not for this one. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and so I, therefore, I hope the division and uh, and the FMP process, we really look at what it would look like if we had a closed season, and how high those discards would get if it were if we were to have a closed season in the winter time. Because, God forbid, you know, the discards are just going to get more if you have a closed season, and that's going to just re result in shorter and shorter and shorter <laughs> recreational seasons if there's not some sort of way to. Uh, stop those discards from happening it's just going to wind up being a, a cyclical pretty much end to harvest or for, for recreational fishing and i don't want to see that happen i think if if we do a closed season we need to look at also closing the rivers where the majority of that catch is at that way you can have a harvest season uh thomas if i could just clarify i think the the road you're going down assumes there would be a quota in place uh, to necessitate adjusting a season length for something like that. If there is no quota management, then the, the closed season would just be static. Uh, it wouldn't have to change from, from year to year. Okay, so we're not going to be looking at implementing a quota? I mean, that, that's one of the things that uh, has obviously been discussed with some of what's been put out there by Commissioner Cross in particular. Uh, you know, it, it is a management tool. Uh, but, you know, at this point, you know, nothing's been been decided. Uh, so, I mean, you know, well, it's something I we could look at. But yeah, I don't I don't agree that a quota is probably the best way to manage these anyway, with it's such a seasonal stock after a freeze and whatnot. So. Yeah, and then um, another point to make, too, to kind of build on what, what we were discussing was uh, – when you're thinking about the discard mortality, I mean, yeah, you do a season, you know, discards are going to go up. But what we're trying to reduce is the overall mortality. Um, right now, if these fish are being harvested, it's 100% mortality. If they're discarded, it's 10% mortality. So you, you get a net gain uh, even in that that scenario. Right now, the stock is at high biomass. We're not overfished. The, the biomass is doing well. It's just we need to get removals under control because – uh, at the level they're at, they're not sustainable. Any other questions? Um, and if, if, when you have a question, people online don't have any idea who's speaking. Lane Dunbar. Okay, we pretty much know that from December until April, most of these fish are aggregated or congregated up in these inland waters, correct? By inland waters, you just mean like the, the rivers and creeks. Like, yeah, like, not necessarily like, jurisdictional. Yeah, jurisdictional, inland waters. Inland waters is way up the creeks and stuff. That's where that's where 90% of the people are fishing. Okay. All right. We got 250 inland creeks. Why can't we just close those creeks to harvest? That, 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 that would give you plenty of your percentage, 30%, 50%, whatever you want. And then they can, you can still fish in there, 
none, but you can't keep none. And law enforcement wouldn't have no problem because, I mean, if they got fish in their boat and they're in inland waters, get a citation. But there's 250, this come off marine fishery, 250 inland waters, and that is where these fish are congregated. Okay? I mean, I've been in there before where there's 15 boats in a place as big as this room because the fish are congregated in these little creeks and stuff. And if you were to just say you can't harvest them, you go in there and fish. I mean, you know, then you've got 10% instead of your what you're talking about, your your take. And I think just I to, mean, that's, that's the simplest way to do this. Yeah, just to... Because that, that's actually a little bit of a complicated way to do it, believe it or not, for, for us. Uh, okay. A cleaner way for us would be a season, to do a season closure sometime during that time frame. When the fish are aggregated, you could still go catch a release. You just wouldn't be able to harvest because that's, because the way our, that's what our data about. is, we don't have it at that yeah. fine of a level. That, that's what I'm talking about. So that's we could talking, do a season talking closure about, during talking that, about from, that de from December until April when these fish are congregated or aggregated up in these inland waters, you can't harvest them. That would be a season because you can't harvest them in there. Yeah, now if you're talking actual inland waters that are also that are under WRC jurisdiction, we, we don't control what goes on in those waters. Right. So we would have to work with WRC in some capacity to get their rules changed as well to match the management we would want to do in that case. Right. You know, that's, that's the simplest way. This hook stuff and, and, uh, uh, this, these other things, you know, uh, handling them better or or whatever, that's that ain't gonna work. That ain't gonna work. I'm a guy. I take I take people fishing also. Okay, they catch them fish. The first thing they do is grab them right by the gills because that's where you hold the fish, and they take the hook out. Okay, and then they want to take a picture for ten minutes. I believe you said Regulation was doing 90% of the catching and releasing. 90% uh, of the removals, yeah. Of the Total. removals. Yeah. So does that happen um, right when they put the 75 limit fish on the commercial fishermen? So, I mean, that increased the the amount of fish available to the uh, recreational fishermen? Uh, not necessarily, because uh, I mean, at that time, the recreational had measures put in place as well uh, that dropped their bag limit. Uh, but I mean, they're still catching ninety percent of the fish, right? Yeah, but I mean that that's right. so. I mean that there that, really hasn't changed too much, right? Now. But that limited how many the commercial fishermen could harvest. In theory, uh, and when we when we have looked at the data, though, most trips are not uh, on the commercial. The commercial fishery are not limiting out. Very few actually limit out on on sea trout. Well, that's because they can't catch but seventy five. They could catch one hundred seventy five. They'd go catch them. It'd be worth their while then. Make money. Also, if there was a higher commercial, a lot of times we'd be fishing commercially. You got 65. Am I going to make another set for these other 10 fish? A lot of times you're not. You know, I mean, I know I'll catch 50 and, and you know, it's just going to be messy. I'm, I'm going to go home with, with what I got right now. Yeah. And I think that's that's part of the reason a lot of us don't get to that 75 number because we, you know, kind of the theory is to get as close as you can without going over, kind of like a game show. You know, you don't, uh, don't want to fill the net with another pile of fish when you need four more or 10 or, you know, just be kind of gauging how you're catching during the day. And, and when you're getting close, now you, you kind of stop short of your limit because you, you just don't want to clear fish you cannot sell. You know, catching fish you can't sell is is not what we do, not what we want to do, not what we want to mess with. You know, I'd, I'd rather go home an hour early and, and make another 20 bucks and, and stay there for another two hours clearing fish over my limit. So that that's 
one of the, if you made the limit 150, you might see a lot more people coming home with, with over that 75. Um, or if you made it 100, you'd start seeing that 75 bit limit get hit more often. Uh, that's a great point. Yeah. And and the other thing, you know, we talked, you just talked about the fact that we have to work with wildlife to get this uh, inland closure uh, working out. It's not without precedent that division has worked with wildlife. I mean, we, they've stopped commercial guys from fishing in the creek, in the joint creeks on the weekend. So this 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 can work out with wildlife. Um, and it's like I said, it's not without precedent that uh, that you guys have worked together to to control the fisher. Yeah, we certainly work. Yeah, worked worked with wildlife in the past on on things like that. So yeah, I'm not saying that something we can't do. I was just kind of might might you know a few more hoops to jump through, but but it is a possibility, and it could be somewhat clean. And and you know once implemented, it might might work pretty well um, closing all that area you know a lot of a lot of and i really don't want to break things up into us and them but when they stop net fishing above the ferries a lot of a lot of them tout how good the fishing is up up there now because we can't go there well imagine how good the fishing would be in all of inland if nobody could take from there um so there you know there's a lot of a lot of good that points toward maybe maybe working toward that might, might be something to do. And a lot of this uh, soapbox aside, a lot of this trout thing has been, you know, I don't want my ox getting bored. And and believe me, I, you know, from the commercial side, I know it. I, you know, I'll, I'll argue your data all day long and then have somebody say, well, you you just don't say, well, yeah, you're right. I don't believe the data this time. And and now uh, in this trout thing, I've, I've heard a lot of, well, their data is just wrong um, from folks that are usually touting the data. Um, so, I think if you keep both sides pissed off, you're all probably doing a decent job. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comment? What is, what is the path forward from here? You know, we've we've done the scoping. We're we're here discussing a little bit of this now, kind of you know, unofficial capacity. Maybe just discussing what what might or might or what has happened. Um, where, where and timeline going forward and what, what has to happen now? Yes, yeah, so our, our next steps from here is we're, we're going to present all the scoping results to the commission at their May meeting, uh, along with the goal and objectives for the FMP for them to approve. And after that, we're going to get to work actually drafting the FMP, drafting all the issue papers. And I think tentatively right now, we're scheduled to hold our our FMP advisory committee meetings that are specific to spotted sea trout, uh, probably late October, early November. So that's when we'll have the first draft of the plan done and start taking out uh, initially to the advisory committee to get their thoughts on it. And then you know, we'll go back and work on it some more. Uh, but that's kind of the our next steps that we're working. Right so now. for all intents and purposes, we're a year out from actually implementing something. Is that is that fair? Uh, roughly, I'm trying to remember the. So more more than a year, a year and a bit. A, a lot could change in that year and a bit. Yeah, we can have <laughs> be done with all of it. Right, we could have a we could have a cold snap next winter and be done with all of it. Yeah, that's right, and and this could all be totally mute. Uh, done done matter because there aren't any. Not <laughs> we have to go forward thinking that we're going to continue to have trout, of course, but uh, it could be nobody would care at that point. <laughs> Any other yes, ma'am. I was just building off of the previous two speakers with the first one saying that the 250 inland creeks should be close to harvest during certain seasons to the wrecks. And then the last speaker mentioning about the joint fishing water. So currently commercial is out of joint fishing waters um, you know, late on Friday and through the weekend. What about if the wrecks were just a full closure Monday through Friday, you know, so while the commercials weren't allowed 
in on the weekend, they wouldn't be allowed in Monday through Friday. And that would give a great reduction and just pull just moratorium on fishing in that joint fishing waters during those times, just like no commercial. And that way you wouldn't have catch and kill or harvest. You would have you know, a hundred percent reduction during those days, which would make a difference not just for speckled trout on the wreck numbers, but also how they're obliterating the flounder, the striped bass, all those things during those five days. It would, and then they still get their weekends, but we lower all those numbers and maybe prevent future overfishing and overfish status on multiple species. And Dunbar, um, the commercials can't fish in the inland waters anyway, period. No, I knew we couldn't be in the inland. I was saying in the joint fishing where we can only be there Monday through Friday during the day on Friday, and then it closes for the weekend. I was suggesting that the wrecks be closed during that Monday through Friday period to help reduce their numbers because by the data they had, you know, like what over 3 million pounds of speckled trout. And I'm not saying that all came from the joint fishing, but if you cut out five days of cure fishing, that would truly help all the numbers on all the species. Yeah, I guess we are talking about just uh, doing something like that in joint waters. Uh, I think we'd have a hard time do, actually trying to quantify that just because our recreational data is not at that fine of a scale. Uh, to that smaller water bodies, be able to calculate a reduction for that. And then two, when you look at joint waters, they're actually a small percentage of the overall waters in the state. Most of them are up around Albemarle Sound area. There's some down here as well. Uh, but it, yeah, it really would be closing a lot of waters for, the, for that period of time. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll do uh, any range by the way. Thank you, Chair. My name is Charlton Godwin. I'm the um, college supervisor in the uh, Elizabeth City office, and I'm just going to update on. The, um, so far in the spring um, strike last season up in the Albemarle Sound management area. <clears throat> the commercial season, um, their quota was 25,608 pounds. Um, their harvest uh, this year, their harvest dates were from March the 3rd through the 17th. They ended up harvesting 20,160 pounds. That was uh, 4,322 fish. Um, the regular Twelve thousand eight hundred four pounds for our call sign management area. There's a um, another uh, twelve thousand eight hundred four pounds in the Roanoke River management area. I'll, I'll tell you about it in just a second. So that season closed March seventeenth after um, um, nine thousand five and eleven pounds were harvested. Um, the harvest season in the Roanoke River management area is going to open this weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Uh, then it'll close, and they have another harvest season in a couple of weeks for three more days, and that will be their harvest season for this year. And I'll take any questions if there are any. Questions, John? Do you ever see us getting any back in the central southern management region? Well, um, so certainly through the, the Amendment 2 that was just passed, we'll be um, looking at that data in 2025, be looking at the data through 2024 um, to address a couple of issues. Uh, I guess specifically if there's been improvement in the you know abundance of uh, older females in the spawning stock since the um, harvest closure and the, and the ferry line closure. So we'll be reviewing that in um, 2025 and um, coming up with determinations. Or some of those questions here. We will be um, presenting an update um, to the Marine Fisheries Commission um, um, at their at their next meeting as well. And Dunbar, are are you see, are y'all seeing any uh, small recruit of strike? Small sound management area. About the Neuse River and the Pamlico River. 
We are still not seeing any natural. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, she sorry. All. Ma'am? Yeah. We asked if you to stop them. So, stocking, yes, we're still stocking in those areas. So, I mean, there's there's not really a wild uh, fisheries, a wild breed fisheries in the use in the Pamlico River. There doesn't seem to be any natural reproduction. Is that what you're asking? If you're seeing right. any natural reproduction in that system, no, there are still not yet. Right. Right. I've been a fisherman for 47 years. There never has been. Never has been a striped bass, wild striped bass enough in the news in the Pamlico River to have a to have a a, a harvest pool season. Ninety percent of the ones we catch or did catch until it was closed it was um, so we've been stocking in those systems for um since the late seventies and eighties. Um prior to that before we did do any stocking though um any major concerted stocking um you know back to the early nineteen hundreds there certainly were Pretty significant um, relative to that area, nothing like the Evermore sign, but I mean, they had commercial and recreational fishery, so I, I can't speak to exactly where those fish were coming from at that time, but there certainly hadn't been any natural reproduction probably that we have been able to measure um, since the maybe 80s. Yeah. And so, and, uh, so, um, so I mean, in, in, in the harbors, they're not going to. They can't. They can't have babies. They can't breed. So we're not stocking striped bass. That's the whole point of the of the stocking. The, these are wild strain striped bass that we're collecting from the wild and then raising them in the hatcheries. Um, so they're the whole purpose of stocking. Try to get enough females in there. So hopefully they will have some natural reproduction if the environmental conditions are conducive. We're just trying to make sure there are enough eggs in the system. Like they're not. But so far. Our life commission stocks used to stock and still does in some reservoirs stocks hybrid striped bass, but we don't stock hybrid striped bass in the coastal rivers. So far, at work, pretty much not. It doesn't seem to have nothing. I got you. too much pollution. Uh, I'm not sure we can really pinpoint one thing. Certainly, pollution, habitat alteration, habitat loss, flow changes due to all the dams. Um, and I mean, the, the Cape Fear River is a, just a whole other issue altogether, although they actually have seen, we have seen some natural reproduction in the Cape Fear River, possibly out of the Northeast Cape Fear. Um, but at any rate, it, you know, it's, it's probably a combination of a lot of those factors. Will never happen. Those pollution is only getting worse and worse. Well, we are certainly um, still working towards that goal of having having <laughs> naturally sustaining populations. That's right. Can't quit, right? Can't give up. Any other comment, questions relevant to right now? Uh, public comment. Anyone submit? Yeah. Thanks, sir. Uh, issues from advisory committee. The committee. Any issues? Comment. Seeing none. Anything else from the division? Um, the only thing I have that I forgot to mention before is the wind energy update. So you and Everett had mentioned that you would like that. And um, I did speak to Trish Murphy, who's our wind energy lead, and she is going to um, provide that um, at one of your later meetings. And so we'll be talking with you at one of our planning meetings about that more, but that is coming. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I will entertain a motion to adjourn then. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Thank you, everyone.
Thank you. Yeah. Have a good evening. Yeah, thank you guys for putting this on. I'm glad my dog could bark on fear for y'all. <laughs> Thomas, what's for dinner? I'm hungry. Granny's apple fries. All right. I, I, I thought somebody actually brought you dinner instead of a snack. <laughs> no, it's not his time. <laughs> You guys have a great 